welcome to the latest Aviation 2020 video interview. I'm Ben Colclow and with me is Ascend's Head of Consultancy, Eddie Pienzek. And today we're talking about the industry's hottest topic, namely re-engineering. So Eddie, um, what are the technical aspects uh, regarding re-engineering? Well, there's, there's probably three uh, key technical issues to do with re-engineering. Uh, the first of which is the new engineering technology itself. And the advantages there are the technology exists, we should be using it. And here we're talking about the pure power and the Leap X engines. Um, the downside to that is the fact that these engines are not particularly proven in service yet, they are that new. Um, and there's also the other issue, the fact that there are better engines on the horizon. And the question is, is it better to wait for something beyond the current pure power and Leap X versions? And here we're talking about initiatives such as the EU Clean Sky Initiative and SAGE, which is the Sustainable and Green Engine. Um, technical program, both of which are producing new ideas and engines, things like Open Rotor, the CRISP program and the Advanced GTF as well. Um, the second of the technical issues is to do with the actual economics and the efficiency. And we've all heard the numbers, you know, 15 to 16 percent fuel uh, improvements, 50 percent uh, nitrous oxide savings, um, and these engines will generate savings. Um, the downside again, uh, the opposite side of the coin so to speak, uh, is to do with things like payback time. You know, there's research and development costs in terms of reworking the airframes to take these engines. The aircraft will cost more because the engines are going to cost more. Um, and then you really have to balance how much of an efficiency gain there is and benefits against whether it's cancelled by the R&D costs. Plus, of course, the buyers, uh, the operators, the lessors, the financiers, they have to pay up front. And in this particular economic climate, that's perhaps not a good issue. Um, the third one really is the fact that technically this can be done. Uh, the existing airframes can be fitted with um, uh, with these new engines, um, although I believe it's a lot easier on the Airbus product than it is on the Boeing product. Uh, but again, the downside to that argument is the fact that it's done at a price. The aircraft will be cost a little bit more, and therefore you have to balance that out. And uh, what about the market that issues? Well, again, there's probably three key. Uh, market-driven issues um, that we need to be aware of. The first one, of course, is the market potential itself. You know, will the aircraft sell? And we're quite bullish on that. If if this particular aeroplane um, did come into existence, we can see a potential market for it. Maybe 2,000 aeroplanes. We've seen figures as high as three and a half thousand, um, maybe even five thousand. I think the potential for for having a next-generation aircraft out there is is quite strong. Um, the corollary to that is about that it conflicts with um, with a backlog that currently exists. Um, usually, when you introduce a new type or a, a re-engine model, you have a declining backlog. You have aircraft sales falling away, and there's a natural successor stage coming into play. But what we have here is we still have say 2,000 A320s on order. We have you know a similar amount of uh, Boeing 737-800. So there's no real uh, demand for. Uh, for a new uh, model uh, from that perspective. Um, so you've got different conflicts and different issues coming into play. Um, will the order books, the, the existing order books be cannibalized? Um, will there be parallel production? Uh, inevitably there must be, so you're going to have two lines producing two different types of airplane. Um, in the case of the A320 you could end up with, with a production line offering three or four different engine types and at different price uh, levels as well. Um, so while there's a greater engine choice, it does create conflicts and it does make you wonder um, how the lessors and the airlines are going to react to that. Which probably leads me on to the, on to the second point, is you know, who actually wants these aircraft. And I guess airlines will want any model that reduces their costs and improves their efficiencies. The counter to that, of course, is the fact that the lessors probably aren't as interested. And from what we've heard, they're very lukewarm to this suggestion. I suspect they have residual value concerns of a introducing an interim type into their fleets. Um, a new model like this may disrupt their existing business models and the prices they've paid for the aircraft they're already taking and still have to take. And of course the residual value assumptions that sit behind those aircraft going forwards. Um, and effectively you could end up with an aircraft type, let's say like the MD-80, which was a, a kind of an interim aeroplane as well. Um, it did sell, but it sold to a relatively small number of, of large operators and, uh, and that did compromise its market potential going forwards. And I guess the third issue uh, on the market driven um, aspect is, is the competition itself. Um, Airbus and Boeing obviously feel they have to meet if not beat. Um, Bombardier with their C-Series, Comac with their C919, uh, Mitsubishi with their MRJ uh, and even the, the Russian uh, Irkut uh, MS-21. Um, I suppose the question to 
counter that particular argument is the fact that, well, how, how immediate is this threat? You know, will these aircraft be delivered on time? Will it prove to be reliable from day one? Bearing in mind a lot of these are new airframes as well as new engines. Um, will they pinch sales from the Airbus and Boeing camp? So again, that's a, an issue that um, both Airbus and Boeing have to, uh, have to think over deep and hard before they make their decisions. And based on what we know to date, what's your opinion of what should happen next? Well, there's the big question, um, and I hope that what we've seen through, through just briefly talking through uh, some of these key issues is the fact that there's a large degree of uncertainty. Um, there are a lot of advantages to the program, there are also a lot of disadvantages, and all from different aspects. And when you get to see such a large range of, of, uh, of issues at play uh, on both sides of the fence, that tends to indicate that there's a large risk involved in taking any decision forward. Um, so what we have seen so far, based on the information we've got to date, is that um, it's probably uh, the re-engineering issues want to be avoided, uh, and perhaps more work should be put towards uh, looking at an all-new airframe uh, married to uh, an all-new engine. And uh, bearing in mind that some of the, the current initiatives might produce a new engine between about 2016 up to 2020, above and beyond what we already have in terms of LEAPX and pure power. Um, and various derivatives of those, then um, we think there's probably still room to look forward to there. Thank you very much, Eddie. Um, I think this is set to rumble on for a little while yet. But for a more in-depth analysis of this and other hot topics, um, check out our latest edition of Viewpoint, which is available now. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.